Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the second of our industry talks here at Associated Studios. Uh, so for those of you that this is the first time you're joining in, uh, I'd like you to welcome you. I am Scott Harrison, I'm the Senior Musical Theatre Consultant at Associated Studios. Um, and basically, uh, before I introduce our incredible, wonderful guest, uh, I just want to kind of like just basically tell you what this is all about. Um, here at Associated Studios, we had these industry talks with our students um, on a regular basis and we decided that we wanted to kind of, you know, just make sure that we were doing something while people were in lockdown and feeling perhaps like they had, um, you know, needed a little bit more inspiration while the industry is, is in a state of uh, kind of 
like let's say kind of uh, it's currently sleeping it's currently napping and so while while that was happening we wanted to make sure that everybody was still um, staying on top of their game and so we've decided to bring our industry talks online um, and bring you some of the most awesome people uh, from the from the industry to come and talk to you and there is there is very um, very little people that can I can say are probably more awesome than the amazing Nick Ollett, who is here with us today. So um, welcome, Nick. Thank you, Scott. Welcome to you. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, it's, we're so we're so thankful to have you. Um, well, so a, so we it's have a great, great, great pleasure. Yeah, it's, it really, really is, and it's it's always really good to hear from uh, from somebody who is on the production side, on as a producer, because lots of um, the students um, and young performers hear lots from the the kind of the, the directors, mm. musical directors, the more the artists, artistic team, yeah. rather than the production side, um, which I think is uh, really really interesting to kind of hear from your side as well. Um, and um, obviously you spent a long time in your career as, as an executive producer. Um, and yeah. actually the first question comes from me um, because I think that um, it's a really in interesting question to ask. Um, if you could tell us a little bit more about what it means to be an executive producer and what that role actually entails. Okay. Well, look, um, l let me start very quickly by taking you a step back. I and mean, you talked about... You've had a lot of artists and directors, and and I got to do what I'm doing, really thanks to one person who gave me a very very hard but good bit of advice when I was leaving school. Like a lot of people, I, I acted in plays at school, and, and that's what I thought I wanted to do. And when I was leaving, my English teacher, who was sort of like a more gentle Robin Williams figure from, um, uh, you know, the, that movie, yeah. um, <laughs> said to me. Uh, you're leaving I gather you want to be an actor and I said yes I do so yeah I do and he said well can I give you a bit of advice you're not good enough <laughs> and that was like a kind of hammer blow but he said but don't despair he said because you know you're reasonably bright and there are many many other jobs within the theatre that you could do have a look and and have an explore and you know up to that point Scott I hadn't really thought about it I mean I knew there were people who worked backstage and people who, who you know pulled ropes and people who made costumes and people who moved props around but I didn't really know what what they did yeah so a look very long story short I dropped out of university I was a hopeless student and went to work at the Northcote Theatre which was a, a very pretty rep theatre down in in Exeter in um, the West Country and I learned from the ground up and, and essentially, I could not have been, I think, an effective executive producer had I not done that, had I not done the stagehand work, the assistant stage manager, literally everything from sweeping stages, making coffee, sitting on the book, calling shows, um, even putting on a costume sometimes and being an acting ASM. Um, and through a whole series of circumstances, lucky circumstances, I, I ended up running a theatre uh, in Northampton at the age of 23, um, I was sort of very young and very well behind wow. the ears. And again, learned the other side of the important side of, 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 of creating a, a sound financial model, if you like, to produce stuff. And then I ended up with cam working with Cameron McIntosh. Um, I wasn't an executive producer to start with. I was the theatre manager at the New London where Cats opened in 1981. From there, I became a production administrator. I mean, these titles don't really mean a lot, but they do when you have them. Um, and then uh, I would say probably by the end of the 80s, middle, middle to the end of the 80s, I became an executive producer. And an executive producer in the theatre is very different from an executive producer, say, in the cinema or on television. Having been an executive producer, credited executive producer on a Hollywood film uh, of Les Mis that won Oscars, um, I had very, very little to do with the making of the movie of Les Mis. It was a sort of honorific title, if you like, because I'd been involved in the original production. But when it came to the original production, I sort of did everything. It, it, again, it depends how big is your organisation. Our organisation is now very big. Um, in the early 80s, it wasn't. It was quite small. Um, so we did everything yeah. at that point from casting the show, working with the casting director, um, working out the marketing campaign with Cameron. Um, I actually kept the book, before we even had an accountant, I kept the production accounts by hand, working at night, you know, filling it, filling it in by pen, signing off the invoices, writing checks, um, which again was really, really, really good experience because, if you know, until you know where every penny goes, um, you, you, you're never really going to get a handle on it. But essentially what you do is put you put the show together. Yeah. You are, if you like, the executive producer works for the producer, the producer has an overview. Cameron McIntosh has a brilliant overview. He's a very creative producer. 
He's not that interested in the deal making, though he has a very, very, very sharp eye for that. You know, he has a team of people to do that. And that's what I did for him essentially for nearly 40 years until the beginning of last year. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really wonderful. I think as well, one of the things I hope that the people that are watching this take away from it is is your staying power in the industry as well, is that often um, there's kind of, there seems to be two pathways that people go down in this industry and they either are kind of, you know, flash in the pan, they have a go at it and then they decide it's not for them or people who really who really kind of stick the road and, and kind of work all the jobs and, 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 and kind of really, and really make a difference over a long period of time and make it their kind of lifelong passion. And, and, and I think it's really great to, to hear from somebody who has been at the forefront of, of, of what we do for a very long time time and um clearly still talks about it with 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 great kind of passion and reverence which well, is really yeah, and i do and and someone someone said to me you know what, what what's the greatest thing you can say about your life and i said the greatest thing i can say about my life is i've done something for nearly nearly 50 years now um 40 years with cameron a bit more before that i've absolutely loved and i've loved since i was a child and and you know it's it's given me a life and it's enabled me to raise a family. But I'm unusual in staying as long as I have in that particular position. Um, and I appreciate how lucky I am for that. Anyone who works within a big organisation like the Cameron McIntosh organisation appreciates what an incredible privilege that is. Yeah. I mean, my background was nothing to do with the theatre. I was raised in an army family and we moved every two years. And it was rather like, you know, working in rep, if you're like moving around. If you're an artist, if you're a performer in this business, you will expect to have a very peripatetic existence unless you, say, join the chorus of the Royal Opera House and, and, and stay somewhere for a long time, which is a jolly good thing. Um, the good thing about staying for a long time, as I have in my case, is that you really develop a shorthand with your team. Yeah. I mean, Cameron, the, the, the core of Cameron McIntosh Limited until as I say, the beginning of last year when this happened. Um, we, we'd worked together for most of us for at least 20 years. Um, and what that meant was Cameron say, right, we're going to do this show. And the machine leaps into action. You can never be machine-like. Nothing is automatic yeah. apart from the basic ground rules. You've got to approach each project with the same freshness as if it was day one. Mm -hmm. um, and then you, equally, you have to look after your projects on in year 35 in the same way as you did with year one. And yeah. that, I mean, look, that's a whole other story about how you maintain the quality of productions long term and, and um, you, you know, why the British musical, if you like, broke, broke all the ground rules when, when, as far as that was concerned. Amazing. I mean, that's it's really awesome to hear that. And I think as well, because like, it's the same for being an actor. It's what we what we tell what we tell young performers as well. You know, that that you know, if it, regardless of how long you're in a show for, you still have to treat it everything like it's the first night with the same sense of yeah. of purpose and responsibility and and energy. And I think that's really great to hear that that actually that everybody in the whole team has to have that sense ability about it as well, which is really uh, and, and and also it's got it come you know it comes from the top. I, I mean, I think. I think it's far enough away now for me to be able to say this without without upsetting my friends but you know i remember seeing Evita in year seven which is sort of you know around about the middle of the 80s and it was shocking it was really tired you know no one had been near it from from the original production team probably for quite a long time had they done so i still believe that show with that amazing score would have run for as, as long as something like cats did yeah and what sets Cameron mcintosh or what did set Cameron mcintosh apart from so many other producers is his absolute rigorous attention to detail every time he goes yeah uh, i mean i've seen les mis easily a thousand times easily he's seen it three or four times uh, that number uh, i would say and you know i've seen it in 15 languages he's probably seen it in 20 you know we've all we've all traveled around the world but he each time he visits the show he approaches it as if it was the final dress rehearsal or the yeah. first night with an absolute eye for detail and of course as you know i mean you're all artists every time you perform a role you find something different within it and every time as a producer or someone working as a director you look at a performance you're finding something different yeah yeah. And it's that that really, you know, you're keeping faith with the audience with that level of trust. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we've got the questions pouring in. Everybody's so de so uh, desperate to hear from you, which is really lovely. Um, th this, this is, a, well, I mean, this is quite a common question. I'm, I'm not sure... 
uh, how how kind of satisfying an answer people are potentially going to get, but it is still an interesting one to ask. I've had this question more than once as well um, about advice that you have on uh, how people who want to put on their own productions, you know, after after the the world situation. Uh, we we do have one rule in this. We don't mention the c word. We we don't talk about the c word. Um, but um, in the future, uh, what advice would you give young artists, young producers, young production companies? Um, on how they should approach um, kind of engaging with with bringing new productions and new work to the to the forefront of the industry. Gosh, uh, I mean, look, I'm asked that question so many times, and, and as you say, <laughs> there is no. If there was a simple answer, I'd be handing it out on a piece of paper, going, you know, here you go. This is what you do. <laughs> look, number one, you've got to find something that you really believe in. Yeah, I mean, that, I know that sounds obvious, but. Um, you know, it, it, it could be a classic play or it could be something new, but you have to really, really like it. Trust your own taste. Yeah. Because if you don't trust your own taste, why should anyone else? Um, that's number one. Number two, if you're really starting off at the very beginning, then you need to surround yourself with friends. Um, I mean, you look, the, 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 the history of music is littered with people who put an ad in Melody Maker for a drummer um, and a guitarist. And, you know, next minute they're playing Wembley Stadium. It doesn't really happen like that very often. Mm -hmm. Invariably, if you're just starting off, unless you're incredibly lucky to have a really good source of funding that isn't your auntie, um, then, uh, you, you know, you can probably take some risks that you otherwise couldn't do. I mean, look, do your maths. Do it, you know, it really is important. Work out what things cost. Don't go, oh, well, look, maybe we can get away with this. Work out what you've got to spend. Budget it tightly because it's going to be your money to start with. And then, I mean, look, work hard. Get, I mean, there, there, there's a huge checklist. You know, where are you going to do it? What sort of venue? What, 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 what is your, what is your market? Is it a young person's market? Does it go across? Does it go across the um, the board? I mean, the great thing that your generation, forgive me if I'm saying that, you know, but I'm obviously very, very old indeed. But your generation <laughs> had, which our generation didn't, is social media. So you have the ability to market and present your work. You have the ability to connect with an audience and indeed your other artists in a way that we never did. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw endless small companies trekking around on tour, mainly political theatre companies, funny enough, in the 70s and 80s, that no one had ever heard of until they turned up at a university. Whereas now, you know, social media, I see something, I see a play that I like, I put it out. You know, I, I, I'm like probably most of you, I haven't got very many followers, but my followers go, oh, that's interesting. So you have the ability to connect with your audience and ability to connect with other artists and creatives that we don't have. Number one, trust your own taste. Choose material that you like, not that you think other people might. Yeah, I like that. I, I like that idea. That's it's a really nice idea. And I think a lot of people will, will feel um, probably quite relieved by that answer, you know, um, that, that I think I often say to my, my, my students, you know, like you've got to be kind of true to your own artist and what it is that you've got to say to the world first before you can, you yeah. know, think outside of that. And I think that that's, it's kind of really nice to hear that from you as well. And um, which is nice. I mean, just look, a tiny example, a friend of mine, Eleanor Lloyd, who's a producer has produced an Agatha Christie and everyone's shoulders go, oh God, another Agatha Christie. She produced Witness for the Prosecution, but the brilliant thing she did was she produced it at the old GLC headquarters um, and she produced it as if it was in a courtroom. So it was mm. rather like a kind of immersive theatre experience. So what it meant was people people were coming for the experience, not because it was Agatha Christie, and then discovering the joys of a, a well a well wrought thriller. If you can have something like that that sets a classic apart yeah you know it doesn't have to be hamlet on ice or um something that that will catch people's attention i like that this is really great and really really good advice thank you very much for that um again uh, uh, again a couple of people are asking very similar questions including our incredible wonderful principal leontine haas who says hello um hello leo. Uh, the, um leo asks um and a couple of other people are asking along these lines as well uh, James Turton is also asking a similar question here uh, about what show has perhaps meant the most to you or what show you felt has been your favourite or the most enjoyable to work on and why? It's a really easy one. Look, I've worked on probably nearly 100 different productions. Uh, Les Mis stands out. I mean, because it came, it came from left field in a way that none of us were expecting. You know, in terms of where it sits in the history of Cameron McIntosh, He'd done Cats. It was a huge success, but it was in the early days. 
and somebody, uh, a young Hungarian director called Peter Farago, bought him a cast album of a concept album, effectively, of a French musical that had been done in the Palais des Sports, which is a huge arena in Paris, as a series of tableaux vivants, i.e. there was no attempt to link the story because everyone in France knew the story of Les Miserables. In the UK, nobody knew the story of Les Miserables. Yeah. They could barely pronounce Les Miserables, <laughs> hence Les Mis. Um, and, and within five minutes of hearing this, the score was so thrilling, Cameron turned to us and said, this is my next show, this is what we're going to do. And then, of course, it wasn't an easy journey. It was a very long journey. One had to shape it into something that, that was properly theatrical in terms of, of, of um, the British musical theatre, the, the embryonic British musical theatre. And to that end, it's, it's why he used, he asked Trevor Nunn whether he had directed it. Trevor said, yes, I will, on two conditions. One, I can direct it with John Caird, who he'd done Nicholas Nickleby with, and the other that we, d- we develop it within the Royal Shakespeare Company. So we had the luxury of 12 weeks rehearsal within the RSC, as opposed to the four you'd normally have in the West End. Yeah. And then the comfort of the run. And, it, and it's a famous story, but it's a true story. The day afterwards, we assembled to have Bloody Marys for lunch and hopefully toast our success and choose quotes from the newspapers to put in the quotas they used to do. And the reviews were, by and large, pretty terrible. I mean, they weren't all terrible, but most of them were less than encouraging, shall I say. And we we basically drank quite a lot and said, well, look, it was an incredible experience and it was worthwhile. And we had 24 hours to take the decision to transfer it from the Barbican into the West End or the theatre owner was going to let the West End theatre go. Oh, wow. So Cameron said, after about 3, 3.30, 4.30 in the afternoon, after two or three Bloody Marys, he said, look, I'm going to ring the box office and get the really bad news. And he rang the box office and word for word, he said, Mr. McIntosh, would you mind holding the line? In fact, Mr. McIntosh, can I call you back? We've got a queue around the block. Oh, wow. And that was the first time we knew that, some, that, that the audience had got it and really engaged with it. And since that time, Scott, as you know, I mean, look, apart from 35, 36 years in the West End, um, it's had such an impact all over the world. Um, as I say, I've seen it in 15, 20 different languages. And wherever it lands, it has the same impact. In whatever language you sing it, obviously some languages sound better than others musically, but it still has that power. And, you know, songs from it are, are sung by the, you know, the rebelling students in Hong Kong. Yep. They were sung in, in Westchester Square. They've been sung in Turkey. Uh, I mean, it has become the go-to song for the revolutionary. But at the same time, it's an incredibly romantic, powerful story backed up with a really great score. So it's the show that probably I would go back to over and over and over again. And I've seen it done in a tiny school in Wales. I've seen it done in Wembley Stadium as the sort of the curtain up music for the um, Euro 90s um, uh, football competition. I've seen it, I've seen it done to, well, 150,000 people in, um, in Australia. And of course, the wonderful... Um, O2 concerts, which were, you know, probably one, one of the great, great, great highlights of my life. Yeah. So it's easy. Let me look. You shouldn't have a favourite ch- child. I've got four <laughs> real children, um, and I would never say anyone's my favourite. When it comes to shows, if I had to choose one on my desert island, it would be that one. I love that. I really love that. And I think as well, like especially people that are my age, you know, um, this that show is is often the singular reason we are here yeah. it's the singular reason why we're doing what we're doing and yeah. and, I, and i remember you know you know living living you know hundreds of miles away with a working class family who absolutely could not afford to bring me down to london to see shows you know and, and even then you know bear in mind you know it'd been on on the west end for a very long time um you know because i was i was born in 86 so you know it was kind of like you were the, one. Yeah, so... No, you I was, were, hang on, you were minus one. Yeah, minus yeah. one. You yeah. know, and so... You're actually technically a phantom baby, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly right, yeah. <laughs> and I remember, and I remember even then, I remember being about nine or ten, I remember watching One Foot in the Grave on BBC and there was the whole storyline how they got tickets to go and see Les Mis and they went and they were like, oh no, actually, they're for next year because that's how, that's how, yeah. uh, you know, and, yeah. and, and actually, you know, as, as now I'm in the industry and I talk and I'm like, and people go, no, that was real. Like, we were buying mm. tickets a year year in advance because you just couldn't yeah, yeah absolutely. you know and it's and there are lots of stories i mean you know matt lucas who who, who um a brilliant tonight tells the story of you know as a child coming down to london and holding his mother's hand and standing in front of the front of house at the palace and going you know one day i want to be in this show yeah uh, you know when he, he was <laughs> i mean 
the, the arc of the journey, and I'm sorry, that's an overused phrase. I mean, just to give you an idea, quite a funny story, actually. When, um, when the show was in rehearsal, um, we realised that Jean Valjean did, didn't have a, a proper number in the second half to tide him through to, you know, the grand finale. So um, Claude Michel Schoenberg wrote Bring Him Home. And he wrote it outside of the rehearsal room and Carl Wilkinson rehearsed it outside of the rehearsal room. And it came to the rehearsal and he sang it for the first time. And there was this kind of stunned silence and um, a wonderful, wonderful actor called Alan Armstrong who played the first Tonadi turned round to Trevor Nunn and said, Trevor, I know you said this musical's about God, but you didn't tell us you'd cast him in it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you go forward, you know, 25 years, and Alfie Bow was singing it at the O2, and he sang, he sang Bring Him Home uh, in the evening, no, the afternoon performance, because we did too. And, you know, he, he was getting to grips with the role, and he finished it and held that long last note. And um, the roar started at the back yeah. of the O2. Yeah. And then I looked... And he was, Alfie was about to go off, you know, done his bow, done his bow, go. And, and we don't move, do not move, don't move. And the, the, the um, standing ovation started at the back of the O2 and then just rippled like a great wave down, you know, 15,000 wow. people standing up wow. and, and, and cheering. I mean, there, there are very few pieces of musical theatre that have that kind of power. I mean, you're used to it, obviously, in opera and things like that. But yeah. No, and, it, and look, it, 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 there's no reason why it shouldn't. He says, "Touching wood." When I say this, run forever. When yeah. eventually we're allowed back. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 kind of one of those things. It's like you know, it's it's like in the world of art, I guess you know you can equate these things to kind of you know the old masters' paintings and stuff. You want mm. them to be up in the Louvre for years. You know, you, you don't you don't ever want to to lose them. Um, yeah. And there's not a, there's not very many musicals out there that you can really say that about. And I think Les Mis is definitely one of them. I think well, it's I was really lucky, really lucky, Scott, because you know between 1981 and 1989, which was my first decade in London, we had Cats, Song and Dance, yes. Les Mis, Phantom, Miss Saigon. And as Cameron has often said, you know, for a producer to have a hit, one hit of that size in his life is amazing. But for him to have four, and there was so it was so much to do with the kind of energy of the commercial theatre discovering the joys of the subsidised theatre in terms of the creative talents that were available there, the designers, the directors, yeah, and and the blend of that. And the other thing is, I mean, look, without getting too philosophical and and and, and um, uh, I don't know. The, the, there's there's a TV series that you've probably all seen or should see um, called It's a Sin now, which was about the last pandemic of this scale. That's right, London, yeah. The beginning of AIDS. You know, that obviously hit the New York arts community with a sledgehammer. And I think, you know, we were, it's a terrible word to say assisted, but I think there is no doubt that the UK was able to bridge the gap into New York in that decade that had been left by the decimation of the creative community. Yeah, yeah. And, and it, it, you know, it gave us a toehold, if you like. Yeah. And it was, it was an amazing toehold. You know, by the by the beginning of the 90s, um, Cameron McIntosh and Andrew Lloyd Webber employed just over 60% of every actor, of all the actors wow. in America. Wow, that's incredible. That's really incredible statistic. That's mm. one That's one I absolutely didn't know. So that's yeah. a really, wow, that's, that's Well, if really you think, something. you know, the, the t- touring in America is amazing. Yeah. There were six companies that are is touring simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in yeah. America amazing amazing uh, okay I better go on to some of the other questions because there's just so yeah. many eager people here to ask uh, Rhiannon Templeman Horton uh, who's a third year student I believe at Chichester University has yeah. asked uh, what recommendations would you give to current drama school students uh, and what can we do uh, to help us get more seen and um, by the industry at large okay very good question. Um, I was on the board of the Oxford School of Drama for 10, 15 years, and, and um, we have quite a close connection with um, uh, Mount View, because I don't know if you know, Cameron, Cameron, our foundation, gave a significant grant to Mount View to finish their theatre. And funny enough, I was on a Zoom call um, with Stephen Jameson, the principal there yesterday, talking about you know how how you get through what you're all going through now, and and I I know to to a degree what you're going through. I, I mean, I'm talking about students as opposed to performers, um, because I have a son at Oxford who's who's you know fighting the same sort of battles. Yeah. Um, 
something extraordinary has come out of this pandemic in terms of a survival mechanism. And it is the rise and rise of what we're doing tonight, talking to each other electronically. You know, I'm having meetings with people I never would have had meetings with, you know, in groups. I've just literally come off before this, uh, a, a Tuesday night group that I do with the head of the National, the head of the RSC, the head of the Royal Opera House, Sadler's Wells, the Roundhouse, Young Vic, Old Vic, Stephen Daldry in New York. I mean, a group of people that you would never get together around a dining room table all at once, certainly not every Tuesday night, yeah. had it not been for what we're doing now, talking to each other electronically. And that, I believe, will work to the benefit of you all in terms of getting out there. Because, um, you know, previously, our casting department at Cameron McIntosh's organisation saw probably 15,000 people a year across the shows. Very, very, very few of them were seen electronically. Only the artists that were hurt, that were auditioning in New York that we might be bringing from New York or the other way around, you know, they were filmed over there and sent over there. Now, I believe that people will be far more accepting, certainly in the early stages, obviously not when it gets to the final stages, yeah. of, of seeing people this way in a more efficient way. So I, I think, you, you know, electronics isn't everything, but I, I believe that there's a way a way through to get... Uh, that That's a way through um, that previously was... was not frowned upon, but wasn't really accepted by our industry. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is a really, really, really like I, I've been saying this as well. I think it's a really positive step forward. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah. I chaired I chaired a, a panel on the uh, the Creative Industries Federation conference last November, and I had the head of Sky Arts and the head of YouTube and Tamara Rojo from English National Ballet, um, and a and a, a, a young video director, and we were talking about this, and and the fact is we as an industry have been pretty suspicious of, of you know screens we see it as undermining our business you know a rather cheap way of, of getting the same experience but the truth is properly done it is it's a whole a it's a whole new art form but b it provides uh, it, it provides access to what we do what you all do to a group of people a large group of people who otherwise wouldn't you know if you think i mean English National Ballet have been performing to two million people around the world. Yeah, I mean, you. Uh, I, I had a fascinating discussion with um, a friend of mine who's disabled, who said, "You have no idea what an extraordinary gift this has been for us for the last six to nine months. The ability to see so much stuff online that previously wouldn't have been there. The challenge, I think, going forward, and it's something that I'm interested in. I'm starting to do some work on is how how it gets properly organised so that if if you out there are working in that way that you are properly remunerated, not just for yeah. legacy work that may have been recorded for something else, but in terms of going forward, it's a bit like the Wild West at the moment, but, yeah. but it is an organisation. I think, But nearly every arts organisation I've spoken to has said, it, you know, when we come out of this, it will remain part of their offering. And that, I think that's really good as well, just from a socioeconomic standpoint as well, because there's there's many people, like, for instance, there's there's many students of mine that... that are perhaps uh, you know living too far away, or or come from come from backgrounds that wouldn't necessarily allow them access to see as many things mm. in the world. And and for instance, like you know, I think it was three pounds fifty or something like that to to get a stream from Royal Opera, and and, and you know, yeah. and, and I've got so many young young um, young performers who saw their first opera in lockdown, and I I find that yeah. really exciting because that's not something yeah, yeah, that they yeah, would necessarily absolutely. want to spend their money on, you know. No. Um, I mean, my, my beef, just going slightly counter to that, Scott, from a, my beef at the, at the outset was I think too much was chucked online too quickly. Yeah. <laughs> so the fact that, you know, the National, and I had this argument with them, gave away One Man, Two Governors and Frankenstein, you know, two of the biggest hits they've ever had for nothing. Not, and the artists weren't rewarded yeah. just because they wanted to keep faith with their audience. Yeah. It was fabulous as a member of the audience to get that for nothing. But when you look at... The financial situation the national was about to find itself in anyway look everyone's caught up with that now everyone is coming up with their own structure but i still think it it, it needs to be organized i agree i mean look the only other thing advice i would give in this sound and forgive me if this sounds patronizing it's not meant to be i've really really i mean i haven't been on the front line of auditioning for quite a long time but when i was what was really interesting in the early 80s was how different the british artist approach was to an american artist in terms of auditioning Number one, I should say this straight away before you get cross with me and start throwing stuff at the screen. Invariably, the British artists were much more interesting in terms of their performance than the Americans. But 
invariably they were far less professional. And by that, I mean so many times, you know, got someone go, oh, look, I'm really sorry, I've got a cold or I haven't got my music or, you know, if, uh, can I do this a cappella or whatever, whatever it be. And look, I know now that things are done differently, but it is surprising still how many people think they can charm their way into a casting director's heart. Very hard to do that. Whereas in America, even though, as I say, they tend to be more clones of each other, you know, we, we auditioned Phantom of the Opera over a nine-month period. I went over four times each time I went back the person that had been called back would wear the same thing as they'd worn the last time. So I would remember them as they were. Yeah. And they would remember my name. And, you know, it, it's just all that stuff. It's kind of prepping for it. So, it, you know, that makes it, it, it easy for us to take decisions. I like that. That's really good advice, actually. Really good advice. Wear the same thing to all of your editions. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's a really simple, easy thing that yeah. people often forget about. It's really good advice. Um, we've got some We've got some um, ones here that are kind of, again, similar questions. So I'm just going to kind of amalgamate them into some kind of... Sure. Um, Frankenstein question since that was that was what you were talking about earlier on uh, uh, but it's, people are asking uh, both Kim and Tamara are asking about uh, what you find are maybe the most challenging things as a producer and what qualities perhaps as a producer you need in order to be successful wow um, I'll sort of go back to what I said at the beginning which is trust your own taste I mean look the, the, there are a legion producers calling themselves that pumping out shows around the country of dubious quality, filling gaps in hungry theatres uh, for the sake of it. And, and when I say for the sake of it, they're making a living and they're providing, they're providing employment opportunities. So I shouldn't sniff at them. But I think if you're going to be a successful producer, um, say, uh, and let's move away from someone like Cameron McIntosh, but let, you know, look, look at someone like Sonia Friedman. And, uh, you know, I've known Sonia for, oh God, 20 years since she was assistant to Max Stafford Clark at, at, at the Royal Court. You know, she has a passionate belief in the material, passionate belief in the material. And she has evolved and, and the, her formula is pretty much the same, which is, you know, get the highest, get, get the best piece of work, whether it's a new piece or a classic piece, and then put the best people together with it. And whether that be a star or a really good director, or, or some, something that goes, I'm just going to plug in the best, highest quality ingredients, but at the same time, take risks as well. You know, get, you, you know do, do, do things in a slightly different way. I mean, look, doing Book of Mormon was a huge risk. Yeah. You know, it was, everyone goes, oh my God, it was the most groundbreaking musical. No, it wasn't. It was really old fashioned <laughs> and it was very dirty, but it was, excuse me, fucking funny. Um, and that and 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 it sort of landed in that way, but that was a whole departure from 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 Sonia. I mean, uh, uh, go for scrolling forward now. Harry Potter, you know, the most beloved character, the most beloved stories. Everyone has their own idea of Harry Potter. You know, the Narnia films. I don't know if any of you read the C.S. Lewis books, Narnia, which was you know the Harry Potter of our generation. Everyone had their own dream, and the films invariably failed because they tried to do something that didn't match up with something in your head. And she took the risk of saying, OK, we're going to do Harry Potter, but do it differently. And we're going to do it. We're going to do it when, you know, when they're older and in a, in a, in a different environment, taking some risks on, on really adventurous and brilliant casting um, and trust in our ability to tell the story properly. Yeah. And, 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 and that really is, is, you know, that that's the secret. If you, as I say, Believe in, believe in the thing you want to do. Put the best people around it. God, I make it sound so easy, don't I? Wave a magic wand, bang. It's not like that. And of course, everyone's had catastrophes and failures. But um, and and the other the other quality, the most important quality of all, probably is apps is resilience and determination, because it's very very hard work. Yeah. And if your show doesn't land, it's even it becomes even harder. You know, I, 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 I worked for 40 years for a man who was completely tenacious. And if a show didn't work, he'd close it, re-rehearse it, reopen it. Martin Guerre, which for me is one of the best scores that Bublin Schoenberg ever wrote. We had three opening nights in the same theatre. That's right, um, yeah. Each time done differently. And it still didn't quite land, but he was determined to try and find out why. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, no, definitely. Um, and you've kind of basically answered uh, Tess's question as well about kind of like some of the challenges and setbacks that you overcome. And, and I think it's just really interesting to hear that. And before I ask the next question, um, I'm just going to uh, just just say to everybody that's watching, we love your questions. Please keep them coming in. There's so many to get through. Also, um, I'm taking questions on Twitch as well. So if you happen to be watching on Twitch, you can write a question in the chat. Uh, um, make sure it's about chatting and not gaming. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, I just also just want to kind of uh, just let you know um, about our MA Musical Theatre Performance. Um, Associated Studios, we have a one-year Masters in Musical Theatre, but we also have a two-year pathway. So if you feel like you need a year of really good core training and um, before you can start putting some of the things that we've been talking about tonight into uh, some kind of, uh, like kind of commercial use, then we also have a two-year pathway where you can end up with a Masters in Musical Theatre as well. So if you're interested, please uh, just send us a little email at info at associatedstudios.co.uk or you can just visit the website, which is, again, associatedstudios.co.uk. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know about that. So um, wonderful. Okay, so we're just going to get back and we're just going to ask um, a next question. So um, where where was I? Um yeah. Can, Can I chuck in another piece of advice? Yes, you're... please do. Please do. The yeah, thing is, you've answered thinking, so many of these questions. What you said and, advice. and actually, one of one of the most gratifying reactions I've ever seen to a piece of advice that was given was um, we had a masterclass many years ago. We have a professorship of contemporary theatre at Oxford University, and in the first year, our, our professor brilliantly was Stephen Sondheim, and Stephen presented a whole series of masterclasses, and one of the performers who we had, and she happened to be over here because she was doing them, was Patty Lapone. And Patty wow. came back and gave another masterclass. And and one one person said, um, can you give us a bit of advice? She said, yes. She said, and this will be music to Leo's ears and yours as well, I hope. She said, have at least two singing lessons a week. And they went, yeah, yeah, but when you're young. But now she goes, no, I have at least two singing lessons a week. You know, she was starring on Broadway. She was a goddess. She was a Tony Award winner. And she said, look, it's it's training, keep training all the way through. Um, you you never don't, you never stop learning, as it were. You never stop, you know, yeah. you, you, you all know your, your, your voice is a muscle like anything else and it needs to be kept in shape. So keep keep taking the lessons. I, I really love that. Yes, please, please keep preaching that one. That's a really good. Yeah, and it's, it is so hard. It's really, it's, it is something, you know, when, and I think that's one of the reasons why we're doing things like this, because I think yeah. it's really important, especially, you know, for lots of those young people who graduated the summer just past there, you know, um, that, that kind of like finding their feet um, has yeah. been a completely different thing than what anyone else has experienced so far. So, so it, kind it, of. You know, it's, got, it's, it, it's on the, it works on the physical side as well, because, yeah. you, you know, back in Cats, the first year of Cats, which was an incredible year, you know, London hadn't seen anything like it. We had an extraordinary cast of very, very, very talented people, um, some of whom were obviously really experienced dancers from the Royal Ballet, English National Ballet. Um, you know, from from hot gossip, you know, jazz group and stuff like that, and some of whom hadn't danced before. But in that first year, because it was a very, very tough show for people to do, in that first year, other than probably four or five, the first four or five performances, we never had a full cast on stage. Yeah. Because there's always somebody injured. The only three people not to miss a performance in the entire year, you can remember it now, were Wayne Sleep, Bonnie Langford, and uh, a wonderful dancer who some of you may remember called Fanola Hughes, who sadly left us to go and work in America, where she became a huge star in daytime television. And the reason they didn't miss a performance because they did an hour's warm up before every single performance. You know, it wasn't called. Now, of course, again, we, we understand this much more and that warm ups are called uh, as a matter of course and they're tough and everyone has to do it. But then at that point, you know, when, when, when there was a choice, the ones that did it absolutely as a matter of course were the ones that didn't get injured. Yep. Yep. Sounds obvious, I know, but Yeah. Um Sorry, it, 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 no, it's really great because actually the, this it's 
even even though we're doing classes on Zoom at Associated Studios, we're making a real conscious effort to make sure that there's you know proper physical and vocal warm ups every yeah. day. And and I think I think it's really good for for especially our students at Associated, but everybody to really hear that that's it's essential. It's not it's yeah. not just because we want to fill the time. It's actually well, it, it really was it was part. fascinating on my Tuesday night group. As I said, one of the people was Alex Beard, who runs the Opera House, and it was fascinating to talk to him about what his dancers were doing during the first lockdown you know what they were able to do how they'd converted their kitchens and you know yeah. put, put valley bars up and stuff like that i mean just god keep going because we will get out of this we you know the end is in sight i'm not quite sure where it is but the end is in sight and we'll go back to a normal life and and you know to have stayed in shape it's really the best way to put yourself up into the front line again. Absolutely, absolutely. I've got a couple more questions, if that's all right. So one of them, um, I'm, like? I'm slightly, I'm slightly um, morphing this question because you've answered quite a lot of it. So I'm going to just change it ever so slightly because I think it's quite a nice idea. This comes from Elias Jenkins, and they've asked. Um, or rather, I'm kind of changing the question to ask, what's the most original idea that you've ever seen, um, perhaps in terms of being a proposal for somebody sending you in to produce something or um, uh, and a, a, like something that's been, con- that's been completely different from the kind of thing that you're normally used to expect seeing? Okay, off the top of my head, I'll give you two. One was a total disaster and one is a huge triumph. <laughs> and they're both totally original. The disaster was a truly funny, I thought, musical called Moby Dick, A Whale of a Tale, which was written by a wonderful, slightly crazy actor called Robert Longdon and his writing partner, Harold Kay, who was in a 70s band called The Flying Pickets. And essentially the premise of the show was it was Moby Dick, but done by a 1950s girls' school as a fundraising exercise to stop the gym falling down. That's right, yeah. Um, do you remember it? I, I know the you know, show quite well, yeah. <laughs> it's got a fabulous score. If you can get hold of the record, listen to it. Really good songs in it. Um, and, you know, Captain Ahab was played by the headmistress, but who was played by a male cabaret artist called Tony Monopoly, um, who played, instead of having an ivory leg like Captain Ahab, she had a cricket pad. It was, I think, one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Disaster. The audience didn't get it at all. We sat there clutching our sides going this is fabulous um so that's look one day Moby Dick will 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 find will find its audience and find its magic the most original thing I've seen and you'll 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 probably guess what I'm going to say which has changed everything for us is Hamilton yeah um and and what is absolutely brilliant about Hamilton again is that it has taken quite traditional musical theatre forms and laid over it contemporary culture and the most extraordinary vision when it comes to casting and gone, here it is. And if you pitched it to me, Scott, I would have gone, thanks. Um, I remember a friend of mine seeing it at the public theatre on Light Performance 2, ringing me from New York, his Englishman over there saying, you've got to get over here. This is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I went, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and those of you who've been lucky enough to see it, hopefully in real life and not just on Disney Plus, but you will get a chance to see it again, will know what I'm talking about, the impact that show has. And everyone goes, why didn't we think of this before? And the truth is, people had thought of it yeah. before. They just had to find a way of doing it. That's right. I you remember. Know, the, I remember. I remember. Daddy Cool. Do you remember that that musical? Yeah. And I remember that was the first time seeing like proper rap in a musical. And yeah, yeah. and I remember kind of like at the time, you know. And I'm really happy to eat my words now. But I remember being yeah. a young student at the time and kind of going, "Oh, this this doesn't work. This is not real musical yeah. theatre. This this style will never work in musicals." Yeah. And actually, it really. It really, really does if it was but, done but, in but the right it's way. It's a brilliant way that he has, if you like, blended traditional musical theatre forms. I mean, another sort of interesting little story. Um, when I saw it, when I went to see it in New York, and by that stage I knew we were doing it because Cameron had been out to see it, and I went to see Hamilton and I went backstage to talk to Lin Manuel Miranda. Um, and I was in his dressing room, which was tiny and really scruffy, properly tiny and scruffy, and he had two show relays. And I said, okay, what, why two? And he said, well, one is Hamilton. I said, yeah, obviously, what's the other one? He said, it's to Les Mis, which is in the, in the theatre next door. <laughs> I said, why? He said, because it's my favourite score in the world. And I listened to it and it continues to give me inspiration. That's amazing. Um, and, um, you know, he, he had grown up with that, though the music of the street, you know, as, as, as you saw from um, uh, In the Heights, that's what he, that's what he understood. I mean, mm. and of course... I make it sound so easy. His extraordinary, unique ear, that ability to rap 
at the drop of a hat, coupled with, you know, Tommy Kale and Andy Blankenbuehler's direction and choreography, um, and Alex Lacamoire's extraordinary musical arrangements. Because yeah. if you listen, if you really dig down, I mean, it, it was interesting. I don't know if any of your students had a chance to listen to, um, you know, the tw the twenty best songs that Elaine Page uh, um, revealed on Radio Two this weekend. You know, as voted for the by the public and. In, in the room where it happens was one of them from Hamilton. And hearing Lack, to Alex Lackamore talking about, you know, had this extraordinary song and putting a Dixieland banjo in the middle of it, thought, bloody hell, I wouldn't have thought of that. But then of course you listen to it, you go, it's just, it's a natural. Yeah. So, you know, that that was a brilliantly original idea and it'll be a long time before something as impactful as that comes along again. I yeah, think. yeah. It's it, it, it just move morphing this into the next question very quickly, um, because I, I I do realise that we're we're having a lot of your time, and so I want to kind of. No, find listen, I, 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 I'm fine. <laughs> I put a glass of wine. I'm at home. I yeah. can talk as long as you like. I don't want to send everyone. To I sleep. like honestly, no, no, you're Up really you. not. I think people are really, really enjoying it, and the the, the questions Good. are come flying in. So, um, but um. When you when you kind of got your hands on Hamilton, as it were, it was already a very much an established kind of cultural phenomenon by that point in America, um, and I'm sure you had lots of um, kind of ideas about kind of, and potential conversations about you know will will Britain get this etc. But at that point, it was established and it was an established work. And this question uh, comes from uh, one of our students, um, Lisa, who's asking what the difference is between when you work on something that is new as opposed to picking up something that is established and what the challenges are and whether they're different when it kind of comes to putting them together for the commercial stage. It's a very, stage. very good question. Um, oh, look. I'll tell you, Hamilton was very, very rare for us because I can't think of the last time Cameron picked something up as a whole and said, this is a gem, I want it the way it is. I mean, first of all, the first challenge was the Americans said to us, well, number one, just as you say, I don't, I don't think that the Brits will get it. It's about the founding fathers of America and in particular, a president who never made president who founded the banking systems we know it today. I mean... Are you going to be interested in that? And oh God, we're very rude about one of your kings. I said, don't worry, that bit we that bit we're fine with. We'll go with that. The other challenge, of course, was they said, well, of course you'll never cast it. Went, what do you mean? Well, you know, forgive us, but you don't have that talent pool. You don't have that range of diversity. You know, you have no experience of casting in that particular way. We'll come and audition the people you want, of course. But you know, forgive us if we think we'll probably need to bring fifty or sixty percent of the people from from America. And of course, they didn't. Yeah. There was one member, American member of the cast, and that was a pre-done deal with Equity in terms of an exchange that was set up for something else, who was brilliant and blended in. They were blown away with the quality of talent that was here in the UK and continue to be. You know, tragically, we're all in this hiatus at the moment, but, you know, the ability to cast and recast that show is, is never less than staggering and, and a great testament to the A, the talent that's here, and B, the quality of the training that we have. As far as the material was concerned, of course... The Americans questioned it because they thought they they felt proprietorial about it. A good show is a good show wherever it is. And there was a wonderful moment again. Sorry, these are sort of little backstage stories. Just before the first preview, Lin Manuel Lin Manuel Miranda was sitting in the box at the Victoria Palace Theatre at the back with his family, and I was chatting to him. And I looked at him. I said, "You you look really worried and nervous." He said, "I'm I'm terrified. You know, no one knows about this show." I said, "Lin," and at that moment a woman in the row in front turned around and saw him and she went, oh my God. And she stood and she started to applaud and the entire theatre stood and started to applaud him. And there hadn't been a wow. note of music. And he just he just stood, sat there like that. I went, there you go, my friend. <laughs> um, the challenge, if you like, to get back to the, 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 the tough route was not to mess around with it. It was what it was. The huge challenge we had was building the theatre in time for it because yeah. Cameron had bought the Victoria Palace Theatre, had set a building programme in motion and then put a show in, and we had to deliver by the first night. I mean, yeah. truth be told, we missed a week, I think, but in a two-and-a-half-year building programme, that wasn't bad. So really, all our energy was was in, involved in servicing the American creative team and this cast to make it as safe and, you know, happy as possible it's a pretty hideous prospect rehearsing a show in a building site which we were for a lot of the time but we got there 
And I would argue it's one of the nicest and best appointed theatres in the West End now. I, but, I would agree with that. I mean, I was yeah. really blown away when I when I went, first of all, with the theatre, because, you know, I, I think I'd obviously seen Billy Elliot in that theatre several times yeah. over its lifespan as... You know, being a, being a singing teacher, you always end up teaching some of the kids that are in it. But um, um, you know, just it, w- it was like being in a, it was like it was like being in a European theatre. It was like it was know, like a jewel box. Yeah, it's it? absolutely stunning, and yeah. the work that was done on it was really incredible. And just kind of the like other, the only other, so just I mean, the only other real, real pickup, literally pickup that we did within my uh, memory was we took we brought the entire American company of hair over. Oh, was that was wonderful! Production of hair that was in the park. Do you remember? That's right. Yeah. Um, you know the theatre in the park, and Cameron and I saw it there, and then we saw it, and he said, and it was very important in his life because he'd been in an ASM on the first tour of hair, mm-hmm. and it was very important in my life because it's the first musical I saw with both my parents. Deeply embarrassed. Yeah. I was at the nudity and drug <laughs> references, age thirteen. But anyway, it was such an incredible company, and and for me, it's still a wonderful groundbreaking school. We brought the whole lot over. It didn't really land in terms of doing business, but um, it gave an awful lot of people a lot of pleasure and, and was was uh, something we'll never regret. But again, don't yeah. mess with it. Just pick up something you find that's wonderful and just put it in. I think, and do you know what? Like, I, I remember that production because I remember going to see it and what was so incredibly wonderful... It was probably one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in a theatre was that production really? of that show. And, you know, and, and, and I was not from that generation, you know, yeah. so it was just it, I knew the musical really well. I knew the songs from it. But and, you know, yeah. but I'd never I'd, I was not expected to be moved in the way that I was moved by it. It wasn't wasn't it moving? It was, really at the oh, end. my goodness. I, I'm going to sound like a sentimental old fool, but I'm yeah. gonna, it still makes me cry now. Yeah. Hearing um, hearing that last song. I mean, unbelievable. If, if, guys, if you haven't heard it, honestly, get the soundtrack. It's extraordinary. Yeah, it's really incredible. Um, so that's really wonderful. Uh, there's a couple more. Um, what, 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 oh, yes. What would you say, this is quite an interesting question, um, what would you say are the pros and cons for going on television shows such as The Voice or something similar? Do you think this is uh, a positive way to move your career forward in musicals? Uh, okay, very, very, very good question. I mean, look, on the one hand, if you believe that publicity, you're a fool. <laughs> um, it's lovely to have, but actually, we all know the only way you're really, really, really going to survive in this industry is through hard work. And I cannot tell you how many of those people we have seen in terms of, um, you know, finalists, semi-finalists. Um, mo- most of the winners are too grand for us to be seen until a couple of years later when, when, when their careers crash and burn and the record company drops them. But um, m- a, for a lot of people, you go, you couldn't do this eight times a week. You know, you, you, you've you been groomed and pushed and everything like that. And of course, the exposure is fantastic. And that works both ways, because for you as an individual, that's wonderful to be catapulted into stardom in three days when normally it takes a couple of years. Um, but from our point of view, it was a wonderful thing in terms of regenerating interest in, in the musical theatre. Yeah. And I've often said to heads of television companies, get very cross with me, I said, the light entertainment division of the BBC did far more for us than the arts ent- uh, the arts division ever did. You know, uh, uh, any of the arts programmes who tended to look down their nose at musical theatre, it was those casting and talent shows which really gave us a credibility amongst a younger audience that we hadn't had before that. But if you're going to be in it, for God's sake, you know, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Enjoy it while you've got it, but keep, keep working. And you know, we've we, we we've got some people who shall remain nameless, who who came second and third, and who were persuaded to go into the chorus two years later, and have always thanked us ever since, and have gone on and done other things. Yeah, I, I've I've got a bit of a question off of this, which I guess was something I pr- probably always wanted to ask uh, an executive producer when I was an actor, and probably never had the confidence and now that I'm not an actor I'm going to ask this question um as a kind of like uh 
somebody on the business side of it and looking at kind of like making something commercially viable as 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 a produ- as a producer has to do when you are faced with with two people where one of them has a kind of high profile following is perhaps got some celebrity behind them but someone else is a, a much more um kind of grounded performer who really has the art behind them has um kind of you know the the real skill out of the two people um how do you go about making a decision like that oh it's a good one it's usually pretty obvious and to be honest with you and it's a boring answer you have to go with the quality you've got to go with someone you regard is going to be really reliable there are times when I go against that. I mean, for instance, if you look at our productions of Oliver over the last 20, 25 years, and you look at the people who played um, Fagin, say. I mean, Nancy, in our last big, big revival, was cast out of a TV show, and it was the brilliant Jodie Prenger versus Jesse Buckley. Jodie continues to have a good musical theatre career. Jesse Buckley's become a film star. You know, fantastic. But she had that incredible quality anyway. You know, we knew that Rowan Atkinson wanted to do Fagin. It would have been a big risk. He was obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, but Rowan, being Rowan, said, I'm not going to do it um, for more for the time you want. I'm, you know, I'll give you three weeks. You go, it doesn't work like that, Rowan. It really doesn't. <laughs> you know, we need a year. A year? He's never done anything for a year. Anyway, there's a lot of toing and fraying, toing and fraying, toing and fraying. We cast a very good actor who's going to remain nameless in that role because we needed to get the show announced and everything like that. And Rowan rang up that weekend and said, I can't let anyone else do this. I've got to do it. And at that point, we said, OK, this is a bit of star casting, which is an incredible risk, but he has an amazing quality, an amazing quality. Um, and we should give him a chance. So that, I think that's the one instance ever where that was where he was cast um, as against somebody else who would have been very good and very, very, very reliable. By and large, you know, if your show's not good enough, if the artist isn't good enough, it doesn't matter how starry they are. Yeah. They're going to fall on their, you know, particularly um, they're going to fall on their, on their face and go, you know, you go, well, why didn't I have Scott? He's reliable and, and, and really brilliant. He's got a fantastic voice. And thank you very much. And hey, guess what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm really glad. I mean, of course there are commercial imperatives, but of course, yeah. Same, but, but, but quality uh, will, should always win out. Yeah. Always. I just I'm really thankful for that answer, especially for for all of my kind of you know young performers that are doing their undergrads and postgrads, and you know they see the celebrity world and they and they often try to think that they have to they have to break that side of it in order for their talent no, to shine really through. Don't. Look, look, a show like Les Mis has made more stars. Yeah, you know, I, I cannot think. I mean, there's been a handful in 35 years, and you think how many tens of yeah tens of thousands of performers have been a handful of people who were you know we had. Ricky Martin playing in, 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 in um, probably doesn't mean very much to um, uh, a, lo- a lot of your younger listeners, but he was a big, 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 big star in America. And he yeah. wanted to go into Les Mis. Um, you know, Anne Hathaway started um, in the chorus of Les Mis. Um, uh, people become stars through it. It's very rare we put someone in just for the sake of it. Yeah. I mean, we did that for the 25th anniversary of, of, of Les Mis at the O2 you know, with Alfie Bow and, and and with Nick Jonas and Matt Lucas and and invariably they, they were they were well cast because they could do they could do it. Um, they wouldn't have probably done a long run in the West End. Though so having said that, Matt has. Yeah. Um, no, can't can't cast with integrity. That's that's really really great to hear, and I think that that kind of comes back to round to what we were saying at the very very beginning. Um, and that, like, at the end of the day, if you want to kind of last the, the, the full road, as it were, I think it, that's what it comes down to, casting with integrity, making sure that the quality is, is always the same on, like you said, you know, year seven as it is on, year, on day one. And, yeah, uh, I thought you were about to start singing at the end of the day. <laughs> You're another day older. Oh, good. Oh, well, oh, I certainly feel it this year. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> um, but anyway, with that, I think um, I'm going to draw the, the questions to a close um, because I just want to say thank you so much for all this incredible time that you've given us. Not um, at all. I'm really so it. thankful. Can, can I just leave you with one thought? Absolutely. Um, and, 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 you know, it's interesting. I, I thought I was going to be grilled a lot more about 
you know, what we're all going through now and how we get out of it and everything like that. And I'm very glad I didn't because I spent my life <laughs> talking about that and talking to government to the press. Um, and the answer is, you know, none of us know. But all I would just say is this is probably, I've worked in the theatre for 50 years, the worst time any of us have ever been through. And it's not just us performers. You know, the freelancers in our industry are really, 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 really suffering. There are 290,000 odd people in our business, 200,000 of which are freelance performers, directors, designers, and so forth. And of those 60,000 have no financial help at all. It's a really, really tough time. The thing, it's going to sound really sort of mawkish and sentimental, forgive me, but look, really be nice to each other and look after yourselves because we are going to get out of this. And if I take nothing else out of this last year and a half, which has been dreadful, I've seen so many people out of work and these businesses go, I have met and, and will keep really good friends just by talking to each other and, and staying solid. Yeah. You know, this community of which you've chosen to be a part is an amazing community. It's really, really close-knit. Apart from being talented and imaginative and self-supportive, it, it, it's a really, really solid base on which to build the rest of your life. So... Well done for choosing it. I hope you all um, stay with it. And you know what? This time in a year, we'll be saying, God, I can't believe it was like that. <laughs> Agreed. Let's hope so anyway. Let's hope so. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, but again, thank you again on behalf of Associated Studios, on behalf of all the people that have been tuning in. We've had loads and loads and loads of people tuning in. And um, I'm Great very pleasure. sorry if there's there's a couple of people that I've missed the questions of. I tried to get in as many as I could there. But thank you so much for joining in and listening to us at Industry Talks. Uh, next you. week... We're going to be uh, back at six o'clock with Gus Gowland, who is a wonderful, incredible composer, lyricist, book writer, um, who will be able to answer your questions from a completely different perspective, which is really wonderful to hear. Um, um, but I just want to uh, get you all to say thank you. And they're all coming in. I mean, there's so many thank yous here for you, uh, no, Nick. Sure. So, uh, it was it's a been great, really great, great. Yeah. And, and if I can make a suggestion, someone you need to approach for a future talk, who I think is one of the most inspirational, incredible people working in our business right now is Kwame Kweema. Really? He, yeah, Kwame, you know, is artistic director for Young Vic, an amazing individual. And, you know, his take on diversity, that huge broad take, is, is fascinating. Um, and, I mean, one of the kindest, strongest men and really, really good... I suspect you'd have some very, very good advice for, for your constituency. Then I am going to, I mean, and Leontine is listening email. to this right now. We will definitely sent him an email, but thank you for good. that. Um, okay. Great. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for watching. And uh, we'll see you again next Tuesday. Excellent. Great Take care. You. Have Thanks a lovely week. Thank you very much, Nick. Okay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.